Greetings everyone, this is William Porter and this is the Inspirational Book Club and this is the second part of the program that we started last week with our special guest Mr. Les Bleemaster, part-time professor in the geosciences as well as a program coordinator uh, at the University of Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And so he's with us uh, this week and uh, in this second part uh, to talk to us about the eclipse that's, that's coming up on April the 8th, 2024. And we're really excited about that. And of course, the last time we talked with us about uh, San Antonio and how important a city that is as far as tourism, especially. So Les, again, it's good to have you again. And uh, we want you to go ahead and start where you finished the last time. I know you touched upon the uh, eclipse the last time, but uh, I was thinking that uh, today we had a very cloudy situation and that's not a good thing for people who want to experience the eclipse. So tell us about that. Why, why is uh, a cloudy situation not an ideal thing for people who might want to experience this celestial phenomenon? Yeah, the, um, the star of the show is the sun uh, and the moon, of course. But uh, if it's cloudy, you're, you're not going to be able to see the full effect of, uh, of what happens when the, when the moon is in just the right position to completely block out the sun. So uh, clouds would be disappointing. As we had today, it was overcast. It kind of broke here and there. Uh, if you see patches of blue sky, I'd say uh, that's definitely a much better situation than if it's raining. Um, although I've never experienced a total eclipse, I feel like uh, my intuition says that even if it's cloudy uh, and is not a super thunderstorm, that if it's just cloudy and drizzly, um, it's still daytime and the sun's light is intense enough to penetrate through those clouds and make it daytime. And when you block that out 100%, uh, I still feel like there will be a visual effect associated with the eclipse, even in a cloudy condition. Um, and I'm certainly gonna encourage the people that come with me to maybe rely on other senses. Uh, maybe your hearing or touch. Uh, we should experience a, a small decrease in temperature um, because we are going from fully illuminated to shade. Um, and maybe if we can't see as well, because it's kind of already dark, maybe we feel something more uh, just because of the temperature drop. But certainly I've been told, uh, again, because I haven't experienced this, that, that other animals and critters and insects uh, tend to uh, do things that are not typical of daytime. They do think it's going to twilight and sunset, and so they start their kind of nocturnal activities and then get surprised a few minutes later when the sun pops back out. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, uh, I'm going to keep my ears open, even if my eyes don't uh, give me the show that I, I'm expecting or hoping for. You might address this, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but even in a total eclipse situation, you do have a little bit of light surrounding uh, the moon, which of course is blocking the sun. and if I'm not mistaken, is that the corona? That is. That is the corona. That is the outermost layer of the sun. Um, and during that totality, uh, even though there's still a little bit of light bleeding around, it's dim enough and, and uh, a low enough intensity that you can take your glasses off and actually with your naked eye uh, see the corona or prominences or any kind of coronal mass objections that might be occurring. Um, so. Uh, that's the hope, right? If it's cloudy, you won't see any of those because it'll be blocked, but um, that's the, the unique nature of the total eclipse is because all the intense rays of the sun uh, are blocked out and you can see the very faint uh, other features that are always washed out by the intense brightness of the sun. The other thing that, that if it's not cloudy, um, because you go to this twilight all around, uh, if you think in a sunset, right, you can the sun goes down, it gets slightly darker, slightly darker, over the course of minutes to half hour, uh, even an hour. Um, this goes from uh, daytime to that twilight in seconds. Um, and it doesn't give your eyes enough time to gradually adjust to the dimming light. 
So all of a sudden, you might see a planet uh, pop out or some stars uh, that are visible because uh, it's dark enough and your eyes uh, really pick up on the bright light from those. So I know Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, I believe Neptune, although it'd be hard to see Neptune with a naked eye, will be visible uh, if it's clear skies. And there's even talk of a comet, uh, like it was described some green dragon comet or something, I forget the official name, but kind of low on the horizon. And so there's the idea that it might be dark enough to even see uh, that comet, even though it's middle of the day. You know, I've uh, thought about this and the situation of a uh, overcast sky during a solar eclipse, but I apply the principle of DE to it. Uh, the D meaning uh, the dramatic change of from daylight into a much darker situation as you have in a sunny situation where you have no clouds or at least very few clouds. But uh, in terms of darkness, in my opinion, and I'm not an expert on this and you are, but in an overcast situation, you don't even, with the clouds present, you don't even have the small glimmer of light that is present in the corona. And so the result is that you have an even more extreme situation in terms of this total eclipse making things even darker than it would be if you didn't have uh, an overcast situation, but a cloudless sky, a very sunny situation with that corona showing. Is that correct or not? Uh, it could be. It's hard to, to look at exact magnitudes of, of brightness change. Um, and uh, certainly it could uh, relatively or absolutely be darker during a cloudy eclipse. Um, but because you're already starting in a cloudy situation, your eyes may have already adjusted a little bit and given you the effect of, of feeling like it's fully sunlit. And so uh, orders of magnitude uh, might be uh, slightly different between going from a clear sunlit day to totality versus a cloudy day to totality. Whether the clouds are there or not, the corona will still be uh, present. It just won't be visible to us. So that, that radiation is, is constantly coming off the sun. Um, and regardless of whether we see it or not, uh, the moon and the sun are going to be doing the exact same thing, whether it's cloudy or cloudless for us. Um, so uh, as it marches from Mexico up through central Texas, uh, through the Midwest and up eventually to New England and Maine. Um, the lucky ones will be those that, that don't have that front, that cold front coming through and, and getting that moisture high up into the air and, and uh, condensing into uh, thunderstorms. So uh, I'm, I'm fingers crossed. And, and it takes a lot of uh, different factors uh, to come together to one, make the eclipse in the begin in the first place and then make it special enough to, to see. I, I've read uh, and don't quote my numbers exactly, but I think there are something like 35 million Americans uh, that live, reside, or work in the path of totality. And there's another 130 or 150 million with only a few hundred miles of the path. Um, so this could be a really uh, remarkable experience for uh, looks like two thirds uh, of our population if they, if they make the trek. Uh, and we get good weather, so. You know, I uh, wanted to come to San Antonio, especially because I've been here a couple of times before. Uh, this is the first time for both Yvonne and, and Panya. But uh, we in San Antonio, as you know, lie right on the edge of that path of totality. We're not in the middle, mm -hmm. which basically mm -hmm. means that we only will get a short time of that total darkness. Yeah. Um, and even in the city itself, some parts of the city is in that path of totality while other parts are not. Correct. But at least we'll get over 99% coverage. You will. Whereas we being from North Carolina, it's only, I think about 75%, if I'm not mistaken, but still they will get some effect on that. I've heard 99 is not the same as 100, but 99 has got to be it's pretty close. Some, some pretty good effect. Yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, and it's unfortunate because the the division that 90 that 
partial versus totality um, runs just northwest of campus uh, of Trinity. So we're not having a really big event like we did in October. In October, we invited uh, everyone we knew to come to Trinity and experience the, the annular eclipse with us because we were right in the path of that. So uh, for totality, you got to get a little bit north or a little bit west. Um, and what's, what's interesting is at the edge, right, there's a dramatic zero, zero seconds of totality to, of course, one second of totality. But every small little bit you move into the path of totality, the time uh, benefit increases dramatically. Um, and then as you get closer to the center line, for every little bit you get closer to the center line, it, it doesn't reduce, but the increase diminishes. And that's, you know, think about the, a, a circle, and if you're climbing up the circle, you have a dramatic increase at the edge, and then you get flatter at the top. So that's, goes, that's time. So at the edge, you get very little. At the top, you get uh, all of it, and everywhere in between, you get some little bit. Um, so any little bit you can get in, into the path of totality increases your time tremendously. I have 26 seconds of totality at my house, uh, where I'm speaking to you uh, from today. Um, but I am adventuring to take 400 brave souls from Trinity on uh, 11 buses, and we're mm -hmm. driving up 281 to the north to try to get it three minutes. Uh, of totality and and, yeah. and that's why we're all really uh, hoping for for no clouds. Well, you know, I've been reading about all the traffic and all the people who are being attracted to that more central location. So hopefully, you won't get into any problems like that as far as traffic jams and stuff like that. We we are uh, preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, listen, I want to give the opportunity for some of the participants to ask any questions. We don't have a lot of time left, and I do want to touch on some of the things that we're talking about in our book club. So uh, does any of you have any questions for less about the eclipse that you would like to ask? You can unmute yourself and ask him that question. This is the resident expert on the eclipse in, uh, in San Antonio. I'm curious, I'm curious of what your um, belief is biblically of what this might mean concerning biblical and issues or Christ or the end times? Um, in, in doing some background on you, Dr. Porter, I, I thought this type of question might come up. <laughs> um, eclipses have been happening for as long as we've had a sun and moon. Um, their frequency is varied, uh, but it is quite regular uh, in timing. Um, in early times, uh, I mean, Native American uh, history shows that uh, there are recordings of, of re eclipses, and they're still regarded very highly in their rituals and ceremonies. Um, they actually prefer not to visibly uh, look at the eclipse. They go in to indoors and, and kind of stay away, not because it's anything uh, uh, potentially harmful, but just because that's how they experience it. Um, throughout history, right, without knowing uh, what causes the eclipse. There are lots of uh, different cultural mythologies and religious symbolism behind that occurrence. Um, personally, I feel that if I am lucky enough to experience it, I feel it will likely be something akin to a spiritual experience, um, but I do not ascribe it to uh, a particular religion or a particular uh, event that might come from that. Um, we get this very similar eclipse uh, cycle uh, every 18 years and 11 days um, somewhere on the Earth. So that is just the nature of the moon's orbit around the Earth and the tilt of the Earth and, and the changes between those two. Um, so it is recurring. Um, what makes a total solar eclipse uh, unique or less uh, regular is there has to be a very special distance or position between the moon and the sun. So the moon is not always the same distance from the earth. It's in an elliptical orbit. Uh, when it's further away, it can't block the sun. Uh, but when it's closer to the earth, it has a larger effective shadow. And we get that shadow following all the way to the surface of the earth. And that's the experience we're going to have now. Um, total eclipses uh, on any particular point on the earth happen in the northern hemisphere about every 330 years uh, and in the southern hemisphere about every 550 years.
So it is certainly a rare event and to be alive now in a location that can experience it, that is uh, a, a unique and potentially spiritual and uh, overwhelming or uplifting experience. Okay. Anyone else would like to ask uh, Les a question regarding the eclipse? Um, and thinking of the eclipse, I remember when I was a little girl, there was that total eclipse where it got totally dark. And then I remember as a young adult, probably in the 80s, there was an eclipse and um, I was at work. Um, is this going to be a total blackout or just kind of um, like dawn happening? If, if you are in the path of totality, which is a very narrow, uh, depends on the particular eclipse. It can be extremely narrow or wider, um, anywhere from 100 to 150 to, I think, 180 kilometers or so uh, is as, uh, as big as they get. Um, if you're within that path, um, I'm not going to say it's darkness, um, but it is uh, beyond sunset and, and into deep nautical twilight. Um, and again, what makes it I think, again, I haven't experienced one for myself, so it's all uh, from hearsay from others that have experienced it and told me about what they've experienced and reading about it and, and knowing, um, thinking about what might come. I think it's because it happens so rapidly and your eyes don't adjust that the, the darkness of that eclipse seems even darker than just a normal sunset or, or that transition to nighttime. Um, and, and what really, uh, lets me kind of believe that is if uh, planets are going to be visible, you don't see those in stars, even the first, you know, Venus, the brightest planet in the sky, the brightest object other than the moon. Um, you don't see that until well after sunset. It's got to be pretty dark. So if we can see that plus the other dimmer planets, it, it's got to be significantly dark, but it's, it won't be like uh, dead of night, midnight, moonless night. Um, I've heard it kind of like uh, like a full moon night. Uh, or almost a full moon. There's there's that much ambient light coming from the corona uh, to, to not make it plunge into complete darkness. I can't wait to experience it and then be able to tell people firsthand what it's like. Right, right. Anyone else who would like to uh, ask Les a question? We have a resident expert here on the eclipse. Any Anyone else? No one else. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was going to ask, you kind of touched on it a little bit, apologetically, like, how does this prove that God exists? The fact that the that we are able to see such a phenomena with the um, sun and moon being similar sizes and just the right distance apart and all of that good stuff. Yeah, there's uh, certainly uh, a school of thought that, that ascribes this to uh, a, a hand in the making of it. There's also uh, a scientific body of evidence that would say, uh, you know, it is a moment captured in time of a long history of things changing uh, and evolving over time. I, I would uh, not speak to, to a particular individual's belief in one way or the other. I know, uh, you know, how I approach it. And again, repeat that I, I feel like the experience uh, should be a feel quite spiritual, uh, whether it's connecting with uh, the people you're experiencing the eclipse with, uh, or connecting more with nature, or connecting with uh, your God, or the God that you choose to, uh, to follow. If, if that is uh, how you experience it, I feel it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so I, I don't think phenomena like this can prove or disprove uh, anything when it comes to uh, spiritual or religious nature. Okay. okay. But it certainly reminds me of, um, you know, last week celebrating Easter. And remember when Christ on the cross, when it got dark like that, uh, that's something that it, I'm not saying is like that, but it's certainly that something that we can relate to. Uh, because when we talk about when the um, it, it was dark in the middle of the day, we can only imagine that, but if we um, are experiencing that eclipse, then um, 
we will experience what they experienced. And so it'll, I think it'll be more meaningful to us next time we read that scripture to realize that it certainly can get dark even during the daytime. And also I wanted to ask, did I hear you say you could look at this? I yes. thought it would damage your eyes to be able to look. When you're in the path of totality, which is that very narrow zone, uh, the intense radiation from the sun is completely blocked. And that's what makes it so special to be in totality is because you can take your glasses off and see that very dim light from the corona. Um, even if, if, if so downtown San Antonio and Trinity University are outside of that path. And so in those locations, even though it's 99% and almost totality, you want to keep your glasses on. Uh, because even that little sliver of light is intense enough to damage your, uh, your cornea, the retina. So. Yeah. Um, and, and I agree, we, we are all kind of, uh, you know, products of our experience, um, how we've been raised, what we've experienced in our life. And, and yeah, I agree. An eclipse is just one more of those things that uh, allows us to experience either solely, uh, individually, or, or collectively with, uh, with uh, our colleagues, our friends. Um, and that just builds upon how we are as a person, an individual, uh, reflect on the world and, and our role in it and, uh, and how we go about our, our day-to-day lives. Hello, Mr. Blee Master. I have a, uh, my name is Ponya Porter. I am um, Dr. Porter's daughter. And I did experience the 2017 eclipse that came through. We were in Georgetown, South Carolina, where we were in the 100% zone. Is there a difference between eclipses when you look at, say, the, the pure 100% of this eclipse? Is there any difference between this eclipse at 100% and the previous e eclipse at 100%? Um, there can be. Uh, the two things that could be different is the time. Uh, the amount okay. of time that you're in totality, okay. and and the overall uh, reduction in in brightness. Mm. Um, so how much uh, the sky will dim, um, and that is also affects. I said before, um, the distance between the Earth and the Moon changes. Mm. Um, so at I didn't think, oh, okay. uh, the closest approach, when the Moon is the closest to Earth, um, something we call uh, perigee. Um, and apogee being when the moon is farthest away. Mm -hmm. And the difference between those two is about 50,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So the distance of, almost, of one, rebel, one circumnavigation around the earth plus. Um, that change means the shadow is bigger or smaller. Wow, and if, okay. If the moon is closer, that shadow is bigger, broader, and means we're gonna have more area, which means more time, and it's going to be darker along the center line. That's interesting. So okay. not every total eclipse is the same, but 100% is, I, I don't know if it would be perceptibly noticeable, the right. difference in, but the time between, you probably had maybe a minute, minute and a half. That's right, maybe, around, yeah, close think, to two minutes. Yeah, I think the max on the 17 eclipse was something about two and a half minutes. It was um, still shorter than this one, and that's why I asked. It okay. It is, yeah, okay. the max, uh, I believe, is just south of the texas mexico border in mexico and i believe that the the, the max solar eclipse is four minutes and i'm gonna get this wrong either 32 or 38 seconds well that's um, impressive it's, it's a lot longer that, that, it's that a lot longer. the point I, yeah i think the maximum is something in like maybe close to six minutes is like the longest total <laughs> eclipse you can actually have just depending on Again, the moon's position and where it's falling on the Earth's surface. Okay, that's good information. Thank you. I know the uh, time of totality here in uh, San Antonio will be at uh, 1.34 on Monday. Is that yes. correct? And I think... Yes, uh, maximum, maximum eclipse uh, as it mm. moves through San Antonio and the Hill Country is somewhere between about 1.33, uh, if you're a little bit further to the south, maybe even 1.32, uh, but kind of right around downtown and Trinity, I believe, Max partial eclipse is 134, and, and we're preparing for our totality at the ranch to, to hit us about 133 and I think 38 seconds. <laughs> that's, how, that's how precisely they were able to model the, the timing of these now, which is all just because of uh, supercomputers. It, right. It's not because somebody's calculating on paper. But, uh, of course, most of our participants are in North Carolina, and I mm -hmm. believe the time of maximum exposure 
in North Carolina and a lot of places east on the East Coast would be, if I'm not mistaken, after 2 o'clock, 2.30. I, be, I believe so. And yeah, that makes sense because it's moving from Mexico uh, across to the Northeast. Um, and it takes about three, three and a half hours for it to start in Mexico and make it all the way up to Maine, which I think is where it kind of pinches out. And we, we take okay. Away. Okay. Well, and that's great. just because the shadow falls off the earth. All right. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I tell you what, we will have another eclipse, I understand. Actually, we have these eclipses every year, just not in the continental United States. I believe next year, if I'm not mistaken, one will be in Spain, if anybody's willing to travel to Spain. <laughs> and also, the next one in the continental United States, if I'm not mistaken, outside of Alaska, yep. will be in 20 years, in 2044, is that correct? 2044. 2043 in Alaska, so you want to get that Alaska cruise in? <laughs> 19 years, but uh, if you want 2044, I think it's just barely into the, into the it just crosses the Canadian-U.S. border, so it's not right. even that much of the U.S. What makes these two so interesting, the October and now, is these two really major events, because the annular eclipse is equally impressive. Uh, um, it's like a total eclipse, but it's just the moon is too far away to block it out completely, so the annulus the crown, the corona, it, it, it is a, it was also, I mean, we were on campus and everybody started cheering and you could feel a collective kind of experience and bonding and, and just, uh, you know, unity. Uh, time kind of stood still. And, and that's what I think we can really take away from things mm -hmm. like this is think about all the people that are just going to be stopped and staring 